it was all going wrong, or Morgava was burning. Parts of it, anyway. Claire stood at the windows of the glass house and watched the flames paint the glass a dull, flickering orange. She could always see the stars out here in the middle of nowhere, Texas, but not tonight. Tonight there was... You're thinking it's the end of the world, a cool quiet voice said behind her. Claire blinked and out of her trance and turned to look. Amelie, the founder, and the baddest vampire in town, to hear most of the others tell it, looked fragile and pale even for a vampire. She changed out of the costume she'd worn to Bishop's masked ball. Not a bad idea. It had a stake-sized hole in the chest, and she'd bled all over it. If Claire had needed proof that Amelie was tough, she'd certainly get it tonight. Surviving as an assassination attempt definitely gives you points. The vampire was wearing grey, a soft grey sweater, and pants. Claire had to stare, because Amelie just didn't do pants, ever. It was beneath her, or something. Come to think of it, Claire never seen her in the colour grey, either. Talk about the end of the world. I remember when Chicago burnt, Amelie said. And London, and Rome. The world doesn't end, Claire. In the morning, the survivors start to build again. It's the way of things. The human way. Claire didn't particularly want a pep talk. She wanted to curl up in a warm bed upstairs, pull pillows over her head and feel Shane's arms around her. None of that was going to happen. Her bed was currently occupied by Miranda, a freaked out teenager psychic with dependency issues. And as for Shane, Shane was about to leave. Why? she blurted. Why are you sending him out there? You know what could happen. I know a great deal about Shane Collins that you don't, Amelia interrupted. He's not a child and he has survived much in his young life. He'll survive this and he wishes to make a difference. She was sending Shane into the pre-dawn darkness of the few chosen fighters, both vampire and human, to take possession of the Bloodmobile, the last reliably accessible blood storage in Morganville. And it was the last thing Shane wanted to do. It was the last thing Claire wanted for him. Bishop isn't going to want the Bloodmobile for himself, Claire said. He wants it destroyed. Morganville's full of walking blood banks, as far as he's concerned. But it'll hurt you if you lose it. So he'll come after it. Right? The severe, thin line of Amelie's mouth made it clear that she didn't like being second-guessed. It definitely couldn't be called a smile. As long as Shane has the book, Bishop will not dare destroy the vehicle for fear of destroying his great treasure along with it. Translation. Shane was bait because of the book. Claire hated that damn book. It had brought her nothing but trouble from the time she'd first heard about it. Amelie and Oliver... The two biggest vamps in town had both been scrambling to find it, and they had dropped onto Claire's hands instead. She wished she had the courage to grab it from Shane right now, run outside and toss it in the nearest burning house to get rid of it once and for all, because as far as she could tell, it hadn't done anybody any good, ever, including Amelie. Claire said, He'll kill Shane to get it. Amelie shrugged. I gambled that killing Shane is far more difficult than it would appear. Yeah, you are gambling. You're betting his life. Amelia's ice grey eyes were steady on hers. Be clear of this. I am, in fact, betting all our lives. So be grateful, child, and also be warned. I could concede this fight any time. My father would allow me to walk away. Only me. Alone. Defeated. I stay out of duty to you and the others in this town who are loyal to me. Her eyes narrowed. Don't make me reconsider that. Claire hoped she didn't look as mutin mutinous as she felt. She pasted on what she supposed to be an agreeable expression, and nodded. Amelia's eyes narrowed even more. Get prepared. We leave in ten minutes. She wasn't the only one with a dirty job to do. They were all assigned things they didn't particularly like. Claire was going with Amelia to try and to rescue another vampire. Mernin. And while Claire liked Mernin and admired him in a lot of ways, she also wanted too excited about facing down again, the vampire holding him prisoner, the dreadful Mr. Bishop. Eve was off to the coffee shop, common grounds, with the just about as awful Oliver, her former boss. Mark was about to head out to the university with Richard Morrell, the mayor's son. How he was supposed to protect a few thousand clueless college students, Claire had no idea. She took a moment to marvel at the fact that the vampires really could lock down the town when they wanted. 
She'd have thought keeping students on campus in this situation would be impossible. Kids phoning home, jumping in cars, getting the hell out of Dodge. Except the vampires controlled the phone lines, cell phones, the internet, the TV, and the radio. And cars either died or wrecked on the outskirts of town if the vampires didn't want you to leave. Only a few people had ever got out of Mongerville successfully without permission. Shane had been one. Then he'd come back. Klesl had no idea what kind of guts that had taken, knowing what was waiting for him. Hey, Claire's Eve, housemate Eve said. She paused, arms full of cloves, black and red, so it almost certainly come out of Eve's own goth-heavy closet, and gave Claire a quick once-over. She changed to what, in Eve's world, were practical fighting clothes, a pair of tight black jeans and a tight black shirt with red skull patterns all over it, and stompy, thick-soled boots, and a spiked black leather collar around her throat. That almost dared the vampires bite that. Hey, Claire said, is this really a good time to start laundry? He rolled her eyes. Cute. So, some people didn't want to be caught dead in their stupid ball costumes. If you know what I mean, how about you? Ready to take that thing off? Claire looked down at herself. She was honestly surprised to realise that she was still wearing the tight, garish bodysuit of her Harley Quinn costume. Oh, yes, she sighed. Got anything without, you know, skulls? What's wrong with skulls? And what would be a no, by the way? Eve dumped the armload of clothing on the floor and rooted through it, pulling out a plain black shirt and a pair of blue jeans. The jeans are yours. Sorry, but I sort of raided everybody's stash. Hope you like the underwear you have on. I didn't go through the drawers. Afraid it might get you all turned on? Shane asked from over her shoulder. Please say yes. He grabbed a pair of his own jeans from the pile. And please stay out of my closet. Eve gave him the finger. If you're worried about me finding your porn stash, all news, man. Also, you have really boring taste. She grabbed a blanket from the couch and nodded towards the corner. No privacy anywhere in this house tonight. Go on. We'll fix up a changing room. The three of them edged past the people and vampires who packed the glass house. It had become the unofficial campaign centre for their side of the war, which meant there were plenty of people tramping around, getting in their stuff, who none of them would have let cross the threshold under normal circumstances. Take Monica Morel, the mayor's daughter, had shed her elaborate Marie Antoinette costume and was about back to the blonde, slinky, pretty, slimy girl Claire knew and hated. Oh my god, Claire gritted her teeth. Is she wearing my blouse? It was her only good one. Silk. She just bought it last week. Now she'd never be able to put it on again. Remind me to burn that later. Monica saw her staring, fingered the collar of the shirt, and gave her an evil smile. She mouthed, thanks. Remind me to burn it twice, and stomped on the ashes. Eve grabbed Claire by the arm and hustled her into the empty corner of the room, where she shook out the blanket and held it at arm's length to provide a temporary shelter. Claire peeled off her sweat-soaked Harley Quinn costume with a whimper of relief. She shivered as cool as the cool air hit her flushed skin. She felt awkward and anxious. Stripped to her underwear, with just a blanket help held between her and a dozen strangers, some of whom probably wanted to eat her. Shane leaned over the top. You done? She squealed and threw the wadded up costume at him. He caught it and wiggled his eyebrows at her as he stepped into the jeans and quickly buttoned up the shirt. Done, she called. Eve dropped the blanket and smiled poison sweet at Shane. Your turn, leather boy, she said. Don't worry, I won't accidentally embarrass you. No, she'd embarrass him completely on purpose, and Shane knew it. From the glare he threw her. He ducked behind the blanket. Claire wasn't tall enough to check him out over the top. Not that she was, wasn't tempted, but he, when Eve lowered the blanket bit by bit, Claire grabbed one corner and pulled it back up. You're no fun, Eve said. Don't mess with him. Not now. He's going out there alone. Eve's face went still and tight, and for the first time, Claire realised that the shine in her eyes wasn't really humour. It was a tightly controlled kind of panic. Yeah, she said. I know. It's just, we're all splitting up, Claire. I wish we didn't have to do that. On impulse, Claire hugged her. Eve smelled of powder and some kind of darkly floral perfume, with a light undertone of sweet of sweat. Hey! Shane's wound, wounded yell was enough to make them both giggle. The blanket had drooped enough to show him zipping up his pants, fast. Seriously, the girls, not cool. A guy could do serious damage. It looked more like Shane now. The leather pants had made him unsettlingly hot model gorgeous, in jeans and his old, faded Marilyn Manson t-shirt. He was somebody down to earth, somebody Claire could imagine kissing. And she did imagine, just like that. It was, 
as usual, heart racingly delicious. Mathel's going out too, Eve said, and now the tension she'd been hiding made her voice tremble. I have to tell him. Go on, Claire said. Be right behind you. Eve dropped the blanket and pushed through the crowd, headed, heading for her boyfriend and the unofficial head of their strange and screwed up fraternity. It was easy to spot Michael at any group. He was tall and blonde, with a face like an angel. As he caught sight of Eve heading towards him, he smiled, and Claire thought that was maybe the most complicated smile she'd ever seen, full of relief, welcome, love, and worry. Eve crashed straight into him, hard enough to rock him back on his heels, and their arms went around each other. Shane held Claire back with a touch on her shoulder. Give them a minute, he said. They've got things to say. She turned to look at him. And so do we. She swallowed hard and nodded. Shane's hands were on her shoulders, and his eyes had gone still and intense. Don't go out there, Shane said. It was what she'd been intending to say to him. She blinked, surprised. You stole my paranoia, she said. I was going to say, don't go, but you're going to, no matter what I say, aren't you? That threw him off just a little. Well, yeah, of course again, but, but nothing. I'll be with Amelie. I'll be okay. You? You're going off with the cast of WWE Raw to fight a cage match or something. It's not the same thing. Since when do you ever watch wrestling? Shut up. That's not the point. And you know it. Shane, don't go. Claire put everything she had into it. It wasn't enough. Shane smoothed her hair and bent down to kiss her. It was the sweetest gentle kiss she'd ever given her, and it melted all the tense muscles of her neck, her shoulders, and her back. It was a promise without words, and when he finally pulled back, he passed his thumb across her lips gently to seal it all in. There's something I really ought to tell you, he said. I was kind of waiting for the right time. They were in a room full of people. Morganville was in chaos outside, and they probably didn't have a chance of surviving until sunrise, but Claire felt her heart stutter and then race faster. The whole world seemed to go silent around her. He's going to say it. She leant in, so close that she felt his lips brush her here, and whispered, My dad's coming back to town. <clears throat> that so wasn't what she was hoping he'd say. Claire jerked back, startled, and Shane put a hand over her mouth. Don't, he whispered. Don't say anything. We can't, can't talk about this, Claire. I just wanted you to know. They couldn't talk about it because Shane's father was Morganville's most wanted public enemy number one, and any conversation they had, at least here, was in danger of being overheard by unfriendly, undead ears. Not that Claire was a fan of Shane's father. He was a cold, brutal man who'd used and abused Shane, and she couldn't work up a lot of dread for seeing him behind bars. Only she knew that Amelia and Oliver wouldn't stop her putting him in jail. Shane's father was marked for death if he came back, death by burning, and while Claire wouldn't necessarily cry and beg tears over him, she didn't want to put Shane through that either. We'll talk about it, she said. Shane snorted. You mean you'll yell at me? Trust me, I know what you're going to say. I just wanted you to know, in case, in case something happened to him. Claire tried to frame her question in a way that wouldn't tip her their hand to any listening ears. What should I expect him? Next few days. Probably. But you know how it is. I'm out of the loop. Shane's smile had a dark, painful edge to it now. He defied his dad once, because of Claire, and that meant cutting the ties of his last living family in the world. Claire doubted his dad had forgotten that, or ever would. Why now? She whispered. The last thing we need is... Help? He's not help. He's chaos. Shane gestured at the burning town. It's a good look, Claire. How much worse can it get? Lots, she thought. Shane in some ways still had a rose-coloured view of his father. It had been a while since his dad had blown out of town, and she thought that Shane had probably convinced himself that the guy wasn't all that bad. He was probably thinking now that his dad would come sweeping in to save them. It wasn't going to happen. Frank Collins was a fanatic, car bomb variety, and he didn't care who got hurt, or even his own son. Let's just... <clears throat> she chewed her lip for a second, staring at him. Let's just get through the day, okay? Please, be careful. Call me. He had his cell phone and he showed it to her in mute promise. Then he stepped closer, and when his arms closed around her, she felt a sweet, trembling relief. Better get ready, he said. It's going to be a long day. Hello, everyone. Thank you for listening to the... Um 
the audio file or audio reading I've done of a Rachel Kane book. Um, I'm putting this in there, so if you want to skip past this bit and move on to the next video, that's fine by me. This is just like a cancer plug because I want to do this as well as also I have to do this because the thing you've just listened to is illegal for me to do without having a charity case behind it, which is feel I don't want it to be like a situation like, oh, I'm only doing this for the sake of cancer, which I'm actually doing this for the sake of cancer, but I did cancel this series a long, long time ago. It came to my recent attention that I should redo this in a better format, and I feel like now is a perfect opportunity to actually restart this in the worst possible way. Back in, in 1st of November, back in 2020, Rachel Kane sadly passed away to a rare bone cancer called sarcoma. Now, in the description below is going to be a link that you can... It's going to be a link so you can support the um, research into helping people survive and defeat sarcoma bone cancer and soft tissue cancer cells and all that stuff. So that's just going to be in the description right there down below. It is in pounds for those American ones, but obviously PayPal and all the research still goes to the same thing because once it's been cured... Once they found a cure for it or found an easier solution for it and stuff like that it does get sent around all around the world because everyone works on the same thing all over the world it's just that this charity is based in uk i live in the uk so it still goes to the same goal to beat sarcoma for a long time and i feel like this is the best opportunity to work with it for any rachel king books that we do during the morganville series or any future series that we do obviously this is even going to be in the future series if we do do them so any book that we do by Rachel Kane is going to have this at the end just to plug a little bit of a cancer support for people with sarcoma because it is a rare, rare cancer and there is not a very good survival rate. So just putting that in there to help people or to support the issues that are out there because I'm not going to get any money from these videos at all, even in like the present one. I'm not getting any money of this recording or in the future, if possibly I do. But this is not what I'm about. This is all about for for what Rachel Kane succumbed to in the end. So hopefully that as a team together we can beat sarcoma and end one of the cancers that are killing people. Because no one likes that. But anyway, have a good day.